for our morning keynote speaker. We are pleased to have Dr. Bob Marzano as both a supporter of CCSD and an exceptional leader for whom we've learned today. Dr. Marzano is a co-founder and CEO of the Marzano Research Laboratory in Colorado. A leader speak a leader, re leading researcher in education. He is a speaker, trainer, and author of more than 30 books and 150 articles on topics such as instruction, assessment, writing, and implementing standards, effective leadership, and school intervention. His books include The, the Art and Science of Teaching and Effective Supervision, his practical translations of the current research and theory into classroom strategies and internationally known and widely practiced by both teachers and administrators. Please help me join Dr. Bob Marzano to the stage. Well, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to defend married men who don't wear rings, okay? because I can actually tell a little story about that. Uh, the, uh, so I'm a married man, a beautiful wife, uh, four kids, ages uh, 45 down to 34, I think. I get their it, it, ages mixed up all the time. Uh, but uh, when we, and we got married, my wife and I got married, we had no money at all, and so I bought her a $45 wedding ring. And I'm sure you ladies are saying, what the heck was she thinking? You know, big spender here. True story. She bought me a $75 wedding ring. Uh, and. Uh, uh, as, the, uh, as the kids got uh, older and had to go through school and stuff, we still didn't have any money. Uh, and so I put four kids through, through college. Uh, and by the way, when your kids get, uh, get through college, uh, do you realize you're instantly rich? I mean, that, anybody doing that right now? No kidding. I mean, that just... Uh, and so we got to the place, we started accruing a little money, and my wife said, let's get some really nice rings. And first of all, my wife is a very independent lady, very powerful lady, a psychotherapist for 35 years, and she's, uh, by the way, I recommend marrying a psychotherapist very highly. It, uh, <laughs> Saves me about it saves me about 25 grand a year, I estimate, in uh, medical expenses. Um, uh, and she says, let's get wedding rings, you know, we've always wanted. I said, oh, let's do it, honey, just let's splurge. So she got herself a diamond, which she'd always wanted. And I mean, for me, it looked like an ashtray. I said, what, what that's ridiculous, honey. You get, but she was happy. You could, she couldn't even go swimming with it. She'd go right to the bottom of the pool type of thing. Uh, and then she bought me a big chunk of gold and uh, a big band, which you notice I'm not wearing. And I wore it, and it was a beautiful ring. And finally I said to her, I just hate rings. I just had an accident when I was in high school with a ring on. I just hate it. I just don't like them. So finally I said to her, so well, it was about three years ago, so I was 65 at the time. Uh, I said, honey, do you mind if I don't wear this wedding ring? Uh, and she said, no, that's fine, not at all which hurt my feelings, actually, a little bit. <laughs> I, I was hoping she'd be a little bit nervous, okay? It just, I, and I said to her, I says, well, oh, thanks a lot, but aren't, isn't the, aren't, just, aren't you a tad worried at all? <laughs> and she said, let me think about it. I'm a 65-year-old academic whose idea of fun is writing books. Yeah, that's every woman's fantasy. No, no, <laughs> that's a true story. So don't, don't pick on us guys with no wedding rings. Okay. The, uh, now, I'm a little confused in terms... Sounds to me like another man making an excuse. <laughs> where? Okay. You, you, where are you? You can't do that. <laughs> and I, I, okay. This is, this is a comedy routine. We travel around the country <laughs> doing this. But uh, wherever the voice is coming, you have to tell me. When am I supposed to end? Because the middle school kids are going to sing, right? So I should give them 15 minutes at the end. Yes? Yeah. Oh, my, my mic stopped working for a second. No, it didn't stop working. <laughs> uh, you have 45 minutes, just as you planned. Ah, okay, thank you very much. You're ah, welcome. Good, thanks, all right. <laughs> so with that, I will proceed with my boring presentation on the challenges and promises of a... Uh, yeah, I know Tony Wagner is a great speaker. I'm not. You're going to find that out in about three seconds here. Uh, but, uh, but, I do have a, but I do have a lot of content that I'm very passionate about. Uh, now, I know Tony talked about reconceptualizing, you know, re-envisioning education. And boy, competency-based education does just that, personalize. Competency-based education slash personalized learning, you know, those are the terms now that are used to describe what you're doing. And what you're doing is incredibly important in the United States, no kidding. There are great teachers all 
all over this country. There are great schools all, all, all over this country that are reconceptualizing what they do in the classroom or what a school looks like. The districts aren't the same. They're really not. What we need is a, a, a district your size to show the country that, hey, we really can change the system. And the system needs to be changed if we're going to get to the next level in terms of educating our, our students. And boy, competency-based education is absolutely the vision that can guide us into that, ne that next generation. Uh, just let me talk about some of the aspects of competency-based education that I think you're going to have to address uh, and are addressing. First of all, what problems does CBE solve? And it solves many. It really does. At least three. One would be the student who walks into your class and already knows the content. How many have experienced that? And that just happens, and the system doesn't do anything about it. So there are students taking Algebra One, you know, who within a month, you know, demonstrated they know Algebra One. They really do. We can do nothing with them. We really can't. So there's a boredom factor that kicks in. Uh, another problem that competency-based education solves is the student who is continually behind. How many every year start class with some students who are right on, some students are ahead, and a good chunk of students who there's, there are holes in their background, which you have to make up for. Sound familiar? And what we ask those teachers to do is differentiate on their own. Now, that's a good thing. I know Carolyn Tomlinson's work very well. And uh, for teachers to differentiate, of course. But it doesn't make any sense for every year, every teacher to have six different levels of students in terms of their knowledge of that subject matter at that time. And that's the average, six different grade levels spread in your classroom. So competency-based education, competency -based education is designed to solve that, make it a little more homogeneous so you can focus on students and be able to move move them along very quickly. Um, uh, it's also meant to solve the problem of the, uh, the student who, uh, who just, you know, can never get over that gap of where they started. See, in a competency-based system, you pick out weaknesses right away, and you take care of those weaknesses. You enhance their skills. Uh, the, I, one of the biggest one I th ones I think the competency-based education is designed to, uh, uh, biggest problems to design, designed to alleviate, uh, is the student who has to get through the personalities of, of teachers and just can't do it. You understand what I'm saying? There are some students who, for school, it just doesn't fit them. You know, they have to change their personality, or there are built-in biases against those students. I remember about five years ago, I live in Denver, Colorado, in our neighborhood every once in a while, uh, usually young men come along and they, you know, knock on the door and they try to sell you magazines, and uh, one gentleman came to the door, and he's about 19 years old, African-American young gentleman, and he was just fascinating. Within uh, 15 minutes, he sold me $500 worth of magazines I didn't want, you know. And, you know, I start talking to him, his name was Maurice, uh, and I said, so tell me about yourself. I said, you going to school? He says, no, I dropped out of school, and uh, he was 19, he had a child of his own, and, and uh, I said, well, why don't you at least get your GED? And he said, I don't want to do that. I said, why? He says, school is just not for me. And he told, you know, it's his story, and basically said, I walk in the classroom, they've got me pegged, the school has me pegged. You know, he kind of had that gang talk stuff, and but he was an incredibly bright young man. So I just got to know him and actually helped him out a little bit, helped him get his GEE, but it was so clear that the current system just did not work for him. Now, we still have a country where 30% up to 40%, depending on what studies you read, of the students don't graduate from high school. Do you realize that? You know? Across the world, we're one of the worst relative to not being able to keep students. Can you imagine the talent that is being lost on a yearly basis? Now, that's not to say that if you don't go through high school, you can't have a good life. But still, the statistics are really scary. If you don't graduate from high school, your chances of living at or below the poverty line increase dramatically. Your chances of being incarcerated jump dramatically. I mean, the facts are just there. You know, so a system, a country that considers itself one of the greatest, if not the greatest country in the world, to still have 30 to 40 percent of their students, their talent, you know, not making it through the system, it makes, it makes no sense at all. And it's not because we don't have great teachers and administrators, because we haven't changed the system at the district level in years and years and years. Uh, what types of assessment should you use in a competency-based system? Well, this will be the one thing that I think if you get stopped, it's, it's assessments that are going to stop you. You can't think of assessments in the way we have before if you're going to have a good competency-based system. You can't have a system where kids are just tested to death to move on to the next level. So we have to think very, very differently about what... Oops, Okay, I'm going to quit right there. Thank you very much. I've never had a hand in the middle of a conversation. Uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time doing a little damage to current conceptions about assessments and what they tell us and what they don't tell us. Uh, just how precise are the assessments that we take? Now, by the way, I'm an assessment guy. 
Should you have state assessments? Absolutely. Should you give assessments to students? Absolutely. But how we interpret those should be the big change. And we need to interpret the whole area of assessment with a little more freedom, a little more latitude, which allows us to assess in different ways. And I'll give you some numbers to back that up. <clears throat> So Gregory Sizek, I've never met him, he's just a great academic, read his work for years. He just reports on, well, how precise are assessments? Uh, this was a study in a book um, on formative assessment, oddly enough. Uh, and in that, he uh, looked at a large Midwestern states. He was a gentleman, he didn't mention the state, they looked at their mathematics test. And he was just asking the question, how reliable, how precise is that test? And as you can see on the slide, uh, the reliability was a .87. Is that a good reliability or bad reliability? That's actually pretty good. Usually people say be a, a, a 0.75, a 0.8, 0.85. If you're above that, you're in good shape. No problem there. However, if you look at the subscale scores, you know what those are, subscale scores? When you break that overall score down into more specific scores, look at those reliabilities. They go from a 0.33 to a 0.57. Are those good reliabilities? No, that's way below the threshold. It really is. Now, the scary part about this, so it's called reliability of different scores. Now, here's what a different score is. That's when I'm your student, you look at my state test score, and you say, you know, based on this state test score, it looks like Bob needs the most work in, let's say, uh, estimation and mental computation. He had the lowest score there. Obviously, we should work on that for Bob, correct? Well, let's look at the reliability of a different score. Oops. Uh, it is 0.015. That is zero. Are you with me? And here's what, here's what Sizek says about making a decision about what to work on with the student based on the subscale score on a state test. It's a long quote, but it's an interesting quote. I'll let you read that. See what he's saying? Make a decision about an individual student on the subscale score in a state test is tantamount to flipping a coin and saying, heads I'm going to work on this, tails I'm going to work on this. Does that make anybody a little nervous? Actually, just turn to the person next to you and react to that. What do you think? How many are saying, oh my gosh, we do this? We get together and data teams, we look at the state test or the external test, and we look at our students and we say, boy, Bobby needs to work on that, Sally needs to work on this, our class needs to work on this. Should you stop doing that? No, keep doing that. Uh, actually, when you're talking about the whole class, the reliability is not zero. So to say, gee, it, this class in general, we should work on this. Absolutely keep doing that. It's great data. However, for the individual student, it really is flipping a coin. Uh, what you need is more information about the student, and that should come from the classroom teacher in formal and informal ways. So keep doing what you're doing, but just realize, and if you're going to personalize learning, you have to get down to the individual student level. We have to think of assessment in a very what, different way. You can never trust a single score. Just Please realize that. You can never trust a single score. Uh, let me give you an explanation as to why. Uh, it's a formula. Sorry, I know you're not put, supposed to put formulas up during keynotes, but uh, there, that's a formula. Uh, and here's what it says. Uh, the observed score, now this is the basic formula of classical test theory. So all of our uh, uh, formulas, et cetera, et cetera, all of the measures or uh, reliability and validity are based on this. Uh, it says the score you get, that's the observed score, is equal, equal to the true score plus the error score. Now here's what your true score is, what you really deserved on that test that day. Had it been perfect conditions and you were wide awake, you know, understood the test and it was scored correctly, that's your, that's your true score. And it's, we don't know what it is. We're always making a guess because there's this other thing that's going on called error, E-R-R-O-R. -R. It can either artificially inflate your observed score or deflate your observed score. Let me explain that. I'm your student. You give a test. I get a 70 on the test. That's my observed score. But let's say I deserved a, deserved a 75. How can that happen? Well, let's say it was a time test. Make sense? Let's say you retired, you know, when you scored my you know, assessments, you know, that, that makes sense. And actually, you know, when teachers score, there's all kinds of error that can build, be built into the score. I used to teach high school, and I would always score tests, you know, at, at night, usually with a glass of wine. And uh, <laughs> this, is not, this is not a research-based strategy, by the way, okay? And, 
It was, you know, maybe it was two glasses of wine some night, and if you were at the bottom of the pile, boy, that, those last few papers, you know, say, smirk at me, Willie. Oh, okay, let's see how I well do on this, you know. Uh, so I didn't get credit for some of the things that I should have got. Uh, let's go the, way, the other way around. I got a 70. I should have got a 75. I had five points of error working for me. How can that happen? I got, I got lucky, I guess, at some things. You gave me credit that I shouldn't have received. Actually, I like Elaine Boozer. She's a comic from Chicago. She had a whole routine on mathematics tests, you know, the ones where you had two pieces of paper, one piece of paper, you put your answer, the other piece of paper, you show how you got your answer. You know, and she said she hated those because she would always, on the second piece of paper, have to draw a picture of her looking at the kid's paper next to her. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's error working for you. Uh, so let me dramatize this even a little bit more. Forget about the fancy numbers up there. Just look at that column that says, the row that says reliability, excuse me, the column. It says reliability, 0.45, and then 0.55, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, look at the second column. Let's just go to the first row. Reliability, 0.45. Uh, 70 is the observed score. You with me? Okay. Now, by the way, let's do, I'm starting with this, though, because reliability of 0.45 is the average reliability of a test that a teacher puts together quickly the night before. You follow me? Is that a low reliability or high reliability? We'd say, oh, that's terrible. It, actually, it's low reliability, but let's put it in context. What was the range of reliability Sizek gave us for the subscale scores on a state test? Remember that? Yeah, 0 0.33 to 0 0.54, I believe, something like that. Now, if, from that perspective, it is the test the, put, the teacher puts together the night before is a, in the same category as the subscale scores on a state test. That's another way of looking at things, it really is. Now, look at the last two columns. So, first row, 0.45, uh, uh, observed score of 70, 52 to 88. That's the 95% confidence interval. So, if your test has a reliability of 0.45 and a student gets a score of 70, their true score is anywhere between a 52 and an 88. As you scroll down, you now see how as the reliability increases, that more, the more precise the test is. But still, well, actually, turn to the person next to you and react to this. What do you think? Okay, come on back. So should you strive to make your test more precise? Yes, oh, absolutely. You know, chances of increasing, of, of, of uh, identifying the true score have become better and better. Is there still error in the system? Absolutely. So my main message is a test score is a one piece of data, I don't care where it comes from, which is going to have error in it. Let's not put too much import on it. And let's try to collect more data in diverse ways. We want to make decisions about individual students. See, I grew up in an era, I grew up in the 50s. And that was a time when we took IQ tests. Anybody old enough to remember this stuff? We were given IQ tests and we were given numbers. And I, I don't know about anybody else, but I've, you know, I've kept my number a secret for the last 60 years. I mean, it was so low, and I was just labeled. I really was. I just knew I couldn't do it. I was what we now call a special ed student because I had a very big, uh, bad speech impediment. I stuttered terribly. As soon as I tell people that, I will stutter now for the rest of the, uh, yeah, it comes back every time I think of it. Uh, so we, we live in a world, you know, where we're trying to measure things that aren't observable. You know, so every, every test we give, you got to realize that might be it, but it might not be it. And when you're not sure, the more data, the better. I used to think, you know, the hard science, see, we're in the soft sciences, education, psychology, social sciences, social work. Uh, uh, the, the soft sciences, we're trying to measure things, you, they're not really concrete. I used to think, well, gee, uh, physics and chemistry and medicine and engineering, they're lucky. They measure something, they're right on, right? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe there's even error there. True story, I'll be real quick here, but it's one of my favorite stories about measurement. If you go for a walk with me, you'll notice I have a limp. Here's why I have a limp. I had my right hip replaced eight years ago when I was 60 years old. Uh, I just got old. My wife said I got to the place where I was starting to have store-bought parts, you know, so I had a store-bought part there. Uh, and. Uh, and this is a good doctor, he's well known, and the, I'm right after the surgery, they make you get up about two hours after the surgery and walk around. So I stood up and I said, you know, 
my right leg feels longer than my left leg. And he says, well, that's because we made big incisions and, you know, it's growing back. And there was a name for it. So it's such and such a syndrome. He says, no, it'll go away. So a month later, it still feels longer. Two months later, after eight months, I said, let's measure this. Okay, let's just, okay, let me see. It took four different types of measurements before they agreed that it was an inch and a quarter longer than my left leg. Okay, no kidding an inch and a quarter. And I talked to the doctor and I said, how can this happen? And he says, Bob, it's not a precise science. That was an exact quote. And I remember thinking, if it's not a precise science to cut your femur off and hammer in a new, <laughs> maybe we should lighten up a little bit in terms of what we expect from a single score for a student. No kidding. And this was a reputable guy. He really was, he was well known. It's not a guy who drove up in a van, you know, who said, <laughs> We're having a special today on hip replacements, Bob, and for 500 bucks, we'll do that and put in another 50 and we'll do something about that big nose of yours type of thing. This is a very respectable guy. No kidding. I just couldn't believe it. Let me tell you the rest of the story. Uh, it was so bad, I was, I was, you know, standing like this and, and I, you know, and I go to, I live in Denver, Colorado. What do you think we do for fun? We ski. So I, was, I had skied. Well, it just changed my skiing dramatically, you know. Going from right to left, I was perfect, you know, going down the hill. Yeah, but going the other way, you know, I, anyway, you lost the humor on that. That was my best line, too. Uh, so what, had to ha what happened was they had to uh, re redo my left hip. And what they did is they put an extra inch on it. Uh, my, and that had, you know, deteriorated because I was so off balance. So they put an extra inch on it. So here's the good news. I'm an inch taller than I've ever been in my life. <laughs> uh, true story. I swear I got a whole new set of clothes. And <laughs> My friends from high school say, you look a little taller. I said, well, as a matter of fact, I really am a little bit taller. Uh, so what do we do about it? If we're going to change the way we uh, uh, assess students, we, it just can't be paper, pencil tests all the time. It just can't be percentage scores. So what I put is we need a system that really tells us how students are doing are at different levels of difficulty on specific topics. Uh, what your district is considering is what we call proficiency scales. So let me go through that really quickly and talk about some of the things you can do. Here's a generic form for pr proficiency scale. Uh, the one we recommend goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Start with the three. That's your target that you're shooting for. Now, essential, your essential learning, your learning target, you might have different names for it. Most schools and districts have that in place already. Uh, so start with the three all the time. Uh, here's an example of what it might look like. Does that stuff look familiar to you? Yeah, very common stuff. You know, so in this case, students are asked to understand certain things about the water cycle. So this should be no problem. Uh, the two, that's the simpler learning goal. Now, this is a little different. It's not just here's where I want them to go, but you also have to think in terms of if they're going to go here, what's some of the simpler stuff that I'm going to directly teach which helps them get there? That's a little different. It makes you think more deeply about your content. And a lot of teachers have said, ah, this is a little challenging. My gosh, okay, I know where I want them to go, but what am I going to directly teach that helps them get there? Let me show you what it might look like. See what's happening there? It could be basic terminology, it could be basic facts, it could be simpler versions of the problem. And teachers have said when they think this way, that actually helps their teaching. They say, ah, there's some stuff I have to introduce first. I mean, you know, the simpler versions of the problem before I get to the more complex versions of the problem. Uh, the uh, one is not new content. We say have a system that um, allows a student to not do well on a test but still demonstrate that they know the content. Uh, how many remember Lev Vygotsky? Anybody? Zone of proximal development? This is a Russian psychologist maybe three decades ago. He said, you know, there's this whole area of competence that we need to pick up where the student can't do it on their own, but they can do it with help. So it's not new content. It's basically saying, with help, they can do it. And, you know, and I'm there to scaffold the, the situation. That should be picked up and that should be recognized. Uh, zero is even with help, no success. But actually, students should never get a zero. If a teacher is helping, there should be something the students can do. And finally, at the top level is advanced learning goals. So you got your target, your simpler learning goal, your more advanced. Let me show you what that looks like. Now with a scale like that, you can still have your traditional assessments, I'll show you what that looks like, but you can also do some really fascinating things. Uh, you can uh, track student progress in an unusual way. Uh, let me explain with this example here. Sorry, I was taken with an iPhone, it's a little hard to read, but I'll explain it to you. Uh, by the way, this is AP Chemistry. 
Uh, so, it's, you know, some people associate proficiency scales or rubrics with the lower grade levels. It's AP chemistry. Now, look what this teacher did. Uh, if you look at the left-hand column, he's got advanced, proficient, and progressing. So that was the levels two, three, and four. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, uh, he actually had one, two, three, five different scales. Each one of those columns, he had a scale for each one of those. Now, this was over a long period. This was a very, very long, long unit. Uh, now, can you see the little stickers there? Those are student stickers. Remember, this is AP chemistry. You with me? And as students demonstrated competence at the next level, they would move their sticker up to the next level. And this was done anonymously. I would be the only one who knows I'm the blue star or the green dot or whatever it is. Turn to the person next you, react to that. Good idea or bad idea, what do you think? Okay, good idea, bad idea. Well, most people say it just changes the dynamic in school, it really does. You know, it is anonymous, it actually is a lot of classes, kids don't care, you know, if you know that I'm the blue star, because they, they're gonna move the blue star. They get to see progress over time. Um, there's a, the, if you have a proficiency scale based approach, uh, your view of assessment changes dramatically. You can still have your paper pencil test, you know, but you can also have other types of tests. Actually, there are three different types of tests people talk about. Obtrusive, unobtrusive, and student-generated. We mostly use only obtrusive assessments. What's an obtrusive assessment? Think of the adjective. Instruction stops, assessment occurs. You with me? Okay. Uh, unobtrusive assessments, what do you think those are? By, by definition, they're part of regular instruction. You know, so instruction doesn't have to stop. Actually, with an obtrusive assessment, a student might not even know that he or she is being assessed. Uh, the uh, obsessed, I meant, no, uh, is being assessed. Uh, the, uh, just, just think about it. If you have a nice scale, you know, and you know what the three is, the two is, and the four is, and you happen to see a student doing that, why wouldn't you record that score? Uh, people who teach phys education do this right now. They always have. You know, things that are physically visible, things you can physically see. It makes an awful lot of sense. We've done a lot of work with proficiency scales. We actually have a database of over 2,000 on our website, the free database people can look at. Um, and on that, Anchorage, Alaska, I remember their phys ed department, I thought did a really nice job of the proficiency scales. I remember looking at that because I taught a little bit of phys ed, and I thought, this is really neat. They had a scale for the overhand throw. Uh, you know, I forgot, the three was something like the, the hip rotation had to be coordinated with the hand movement, you know, a nice spin, nice torque, and the two was they were doing the hip rotation and the hand movement that weren't coordinated necessarily. The four was the student was making adjustments for the length of the throw. And I thought, that's really, that's really neat. I could walk out into the playground and see a student doing that and say, aha, they're right there. You with me? Why wouldn't I record a three right there? Is that a valid assessment? You bet. Is there maybe air in it? You bet. But don't forget, there's air in everything that we do. Uh, so obtrusive assessment, unobtrusive student-generated assessment is my favorite. That's where the student says to you, I'm ready to show you that I'm a four, or I'm ready to show you that I'm a three. How many have students who don't do well on tests, but you know they know the content? How many out there have kids of your own who you know they know the content, but they don't do it. How many sitting out there were students who knew the content but didn't do well on tests? Yeah, so we're locked into this. A test has to be, you know, a paper pencil thing, a paper pencil, it really doesn't. Um, uh, actually, one of my favorite forms of tests what are called uh, probing discussions, where you simply sit down with a student and say, start telling me about the, uh, the cell membrane. A little bit more there, a little bit more there, a little bit more there. There was a study done by Sheila Valencia uh, about 10 years ago now where she looked at uh, different types of assessments and one was a probing discussion. She simply sat down with the student. 
that what she found is you got 66 more percent more information from a probing discussion than you did for any, from any of the traditional types of assessments. So going into this, you have to expand your notion about what assessment looks like, otherwise you're going to get killed with tests and you're going to kill the students with tests. Can you still use the traditional assessment? You can, but probably, uh, probably sparingly. Uh, let me go into this. Should, do I have time to go into this? Maybe I don't. Uh, just turn to the person next to you for a second and let me talk amongst yourselves for three seconds because I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to skip a few things here. Okay. Uh, if you want some examples of proficiency scales, uh, we have a lot of examples for you on our website, morizontoresearch.com. Just take a look at them. This is the way they look. This is what we're recommending for you. Uh, we identify the three, the two, and the four. You give sample activities, uh, assessment activities teachers can use. Uh, we have a book. Reason I put that up there, some of you are working with David Yanoski, he's the author of a lot of these things. So you're working with really fine people, uh, our people, the risk people. Uh, the uh, expanded view of assessment, you know, that's, if, if you don't do that, again, you're just gonna hamstring yourself. Our general uh, uh, recommendation is, think in terms of assessing more, but testing less. I'll say it again, assessing more, but testing less. Uh, we work with teachers, and the big aha for them is they'll say things like, you know, I didn't realize that I didn't always have to have a paper pencil test to make a judgment about students. You know, and it didn't always have to be something concrete. It just could be a conversation, you know, with students. Now, remember, I spent a lot of time on purpose saying the assessments we have right now, they're designed by states, you know, and national organizations. And they're great tests. They're great test makers, but they all have error built in. You know, and in a system like that, the more data you have, the better things are. Uh, now, what can you do with this? Well, a lot of things, other than just test differently. Uh, teaching might look different uh, in terms of you have more focus, you know what students know, what they don't know, and that focuses your instruction. Actually, one of the things that's very powerful is students track their own progress. Let me explain this, uh, kind of a funny slide. Uh, you can uh, look at the, t the, the horizontal axis, and that's the scale, right? The 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we have half point scores you can use. Now, look at the rows. This says T1, T2, T3, all the way down to T24. That stands for topic 1, topic 2, down to topic 24. So in a competency-based system, and this would be an individual teacher in his or her classroom, with this, this teacher has 24 proficiency scales, which cover the entire year. You don't teach them all, you know, but you do have, you've laid out the entire year. I'm going to cover these 24 things, or these 20 things, you know, or these 15 things. You have a proficiency scale for each. Now, each student has a matrix that looks something like this. This is my matrix, let's say. I'm Bobby, I'm in your class. This is the end of the first quarter. How well have I done? Well, in topic one, I've got a 2.5. Topic two, a one point. You follow me? Now, I can turn that into a grade. If you want to have grades, I'll show you what that looks like in a second. That's quarter number one. Let's look at quarter number two. Let's look at quarter number three. Let's look at quarter number four. Let me do that again. Quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. Can you see what's happening here? See, in a competency-based system, students have the invitation to go back and take things that they didn't do well on and increase their score. And what you're doing now, if you do assign overall grades, you know, what you're doing is saying the first quarter grade is based on what they did that quarter. The second quarter grade is based on what they did the second quarter and the first quarter. So it just accumulates. So a student who starts slow can still end very, very fast. And boy, this changes the game dramatically. Students know, you know, that if they start slow, that ball game's not over. See, in a traditional system, there are some students who after the first two tests say, highest grade I can get is a C. You know. This is it. Why would I try harder? You know, I can't, you know, I, I, I can never dig myself out of this hole. Turn to the person next to you, react to this. What do you think?
Okay. Now, classroom teachers, I'm sure you're saying, oh my gosh, what a lot of work. I have to create the proficiency scales. No. A system that is competency-based does that with you and for you. You know, so that's what's going on, the work that's going on right now. You know, what are the, what are the proficiencies that are going to be addressed at grade three in mathematics or level three in mathematics? And what are the scales for those? And what are the items that we're going to use to be able to assess students and the activities that we're going to use? So that'll be done for you. So imagine being hired in, you know, and you're handing a little packet. Say, hey, Bob, you know, you're teaching level seven mathematics or grade seven mathematics. And, you know, here are the 20 areas you're going to be covering over the year. And here are the proficiency scales that go along with it. And here are some assessment activities for, for you to use. Now, you still have a lot of freedom to how, how you design assessments, right? You will have district design assessments. You'll have common assessments. But you'll also have the opportunity to use unobtrusive assessments, student-generated assessments. You're interacting with the students and probing discussions. You know, so the teacher now becomes much more important in the decision-making process about how a student, a student is doing. More important than that, the student becomes more important in the decision-making process about how they're doing. Because the student can always say, I know I haven't shown you yet. I've been blowing the tests. I realize that. But I can demonstrate to you right now that I'm a three or that I'm a four. Again, that changes the game absolutely dram dramatically. So you're doing something, really, it's cutting edge. It's a, it's a very, very different type of classroom. Uh, you can still have your traditional grade uh, report card, if you will, but it might look something like this. At the very top of grades, I'll, I'll, I'll blow those up in a second. I want to call your attention, though, to uh, the bar graphs. Uh, take a look at the bar graphs there. So there's a dark part and there's a light part. Can you see that? Notice there's a bar graph for specific topics. Those topics would be the topics for which you have proficiency scales. What do you think the dark part of the bar graph means versus the light part of the bar graph? Dark part is where they started. Light part is where they are right now. You follow me? So the first score their teacher assigns to a student is the dark part of the bar graph. Where they are right now is the light part of the bar graph. Again, turn to the person next to you react to this. You like this? Good idea, bad idea. What do you think? Now she be done. Okay. Is that a report card that gives the teacher more information? Does it give the student more information? Does it give the parent more information? Absolutely. Now, you can still have your traditional grades. You really can. Here's what you do. You know, let's say it's the end of the first quarter, and there are, I've, uh, you've covered seven different topics. So I, you've got, for me, Bobby the student, you've got seven different scores for me, my final score, where I am at the, at the end of that grading period, and there are seven things. You can put those together in a traditional average, you with me? You know, and here's what most, play, uh, most schools do. If that average is anywhere from a three to a four, 3.0 to four, they, they, they assign an A to that. And some people say, three out of four, that's only 75. No, there, it doesn't work like that. What does the three say in this scale? The student has? demonstrated the proficiency in what was taught. And that's where the A starts, 2.55 to 2.99 a B, et cetera, et cetera. I've seen schools do this with uh, advanced proficient basic. Uh, you're in the state of Texas, you have to give a percentage score. I've seen teachers do it this way. You know, 4.0 translates to 100, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can still give your overall grade. You really can. Now, if you want, you can have a system, and this is the ultimate for a competency-based system, where students are at one level in math, in another level in science, and another level in language arts, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a true competency-based system. You know, it's hard to assign an overall grade in a system like that. But you, what, what you do say is that, look, you know, you're at level four in mathematics or grade four in mathematics, and here's how you're doing. Out of the 20 competencies, you've mastered 15 of those already. Way to go. You know, and in science, you're at level seven or grade level seven. And out of the 22 competencies, you've mastered 19. Way to go. Now, that gives students a very specific view of what they're doing. No longer does a student have to go back and retake a whole year. It doesn't make any sense. You know, if there are two pieces that they're missing, fix those two pieces, and you can do that right away. Now, 
the, the, for me, the changing the system is so needed, and we need a district your size to say, we can do this, we'll take this on. And people who cross this line usually never come back. You know, they say, I, the old system just didn't, I could never teach in the old system. I feel like it's unfair to students. I feel like it's unethical to students. You know, because there's so much richer way of doing it, putting them more in control, giving them more, more, more information. Uh, now, it's a brand new thing, it really is, although it's been talked about for three decades at least, you know, and it's moving very, very quickly. As I, for me, it's why I'm still in this game. I remember the first time I saw it was at uh, uh, Highland Tech High School in Anchorage, uh, and I took a tour of Highland Tech High, and I've been in a lot of tours of schools, and I went on this one, and you know, I, you know where at the high school level, students will take you around. They'll show you great things, but the still, still the school was pretty traditional. And so I've been on a lot of tours. And this one, well, I, I wanted to see, well, how good is this place? How, you know, how accurate, how true is this? And I said, I said, what are your goals for this year? Where are you right now at this level? What do you need to do to get to the next level here? And these students had their own goals. They all knew what they were gonna do by the end of the year. And I thought, I, I mean, by the end of it, I was almost in tears. Uh, which is no big deal. I'm an Italian. I cry at commercials. But anyway, that was, uh, I thought, wow, this is the way it could be. Now, it was a small school, small alternative school. Imagine a district that can say, come on in. You know, let me show you what we're doing. For me, the final piece, the icing on the cake, is to make sure you include students at a very early age starting to say, you know, when I grow up, I want to be that. Or I want to accomplish this in the next two years, even if it has nothing to do, you know, with academics, even if it's something like be a better dancer, you know, like our young ladies demonstrate, something they get excited about, pride, something that's difficult and intricate. If we can do that, if we can spark, you know, that, that passion about something, you've opened the door just to everything. Uh, here's what uh, psych some psychologists say. They say, you know, we can explain the human mind in terms of four systems. Uh, and you can kind of view education in terms of how well they address these four systems. Um, one system is called the knowledge system. That's all the stuff we learn over life. Do schools uh, traditionally address the knowledge system? The answer is, yeah, we teach them a bunch of stuff, right? Maybe we teach them too much. You know, if you look at us compared to other countries, our standards are still that big and theirs are still that big. We try to teach everything under the sun instead of saying, let's be lean and mean and go deep into a few topics. We do a great job of knowledge, though. Oh, well, we do a, a job of knowledge. We focus on that. Next system is called the cognitive system, and that's the system that allows us to make decisions, make inferences, solve problems, et cetera. Do we focus on that in K-12 education? Well, yeah, we do. We get a little better at it. You know, the common core is pushed that. We're getting a little better. Uh, next system up is the metacognitive system. Here's what the metacognitive system is. That's the system that, that w by which we say, here's my goal, here's my plan to get to that goal, and m I monitor how, how I'm doing. Does traditional education focus on that explicitly? No, it doesn't. Does a competency-based education focus on that? By definition. You see, students will be saying, okay, by the end of this, the next month, I want to be at this level on this topic and this level, and here's my plan, this is what I'm going to do. I can show you videotapes of students doing that. So they're engaged in their own learning. At the highest level is called the self-system. And here's what the self-system is. It's our view of the world. How many remember uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs? That's your self-system. And we're always filtering the world through that. If you remember his hierarchy, first level is physiology. Warmth, clothes, food, comfort, et cetera, et cetera. You know, do schools address that? Yes, we do. We do a great job of that. Uh, so physiology, we do a nice job. Safety, do we do a good job with that? Well, sure we do. Of course, you know, we're, schools are a very safe place now, even though some horrible things happen here in the United States. Next level up from that is a sense of belonging. Do we address that? I think we do a good job. I really do. Next two levels, maybe not. Next level up after belonging is esteem, a sense of, hey, me as an individual, I have importance in the world here. If we did that, we wouldn't have 30% of the students dropping out of school. And the highest level is self-actualization. That's where students are figuring out what the world is like, you know, their view, their theory of the world, some people call it, and where they fit into it. And that starts at an early age, and they're very deep thoughts that kids have. Let me give you an illustration of that. Uh, I've got five grandchildren, ages uh, 13 down to um, five. 
I think I got that right. Uh, and uh, so it's fun to watch my grandchildren grow, because when I was a parent, I was so frightened as a parent. You know, I just didn't enjoy my kids growing up. Watching my grandchildren, though. Uh, and just the, how they progress and, you know, the human mind and just what a magnificent, just it's a miracle, you know, human beings. It really is. It was about two years ago, my seven-year-old grandson now, Jacob, uh, he was five. And Carmen called. It was a Friday night. And she said, she said, Pop, can I come over? Uh, I said, sure. Uh, what's wrong? She said, well, Jacob is just, he's just in tears. I said, what's wrong? He said, she said, he's actually been thinking about dying recently. You know, he just realized things die. A dog died across the street. And it just kind of got him going. And he's realized everybody dies. He's going to die. His mom's going to die. And the closest one to dying was me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So he wanted to come over and, you know, and I was just, he was just sobbing and it just hit me. He was five years old and he was dealing with what is the world like? Kindergartners walk in to our classes with these, you know, theories and complexities and you're dealing with that on a daily basis and they're looking for, you know, what is it like? They're looking for role models, people who can give them confidence. You know, and they, have, they, they start having their dreams there about what they would like to do and things they would li you know, like to be. Hazel Marcus, years ago, she did a study on uh, students who uh, progress well versus students who give up at an early age. And she said, it's, it's all about future possible selves. I thought that was a neat term. She says, all young children have future possible selves, big dreams. I want to do this and I want to do that. And they see themselves doing grand things. She says, however, as they go through life, students who come from backgrounds where they don't have all the advantages that my kids had, my grandkids have, they start saying, well, I can't pull that one off. Maybe I'll do this. You follow me? See, in a competency-based system, you'd be saying to students, OK, here's all the school stuff you have to do, but pick something you want to be excellent in. Is it stomp? Is it jumping rope? I don't care what it is. Pick something that's complex that excites you and do it. And that'll lead you somewhere. It really will. Schools traditionally don't do that. Now, I've got a classic example you know, of schools not doing that. It came from my family. My oldest, my 45-year-old son, Todd, when he was in high school, was a non-academic. He would have been on the you know, stomp team. He could do stuff with his hands. He loved that stuff. He was very physical, uh, horrible academic. I think he graduated with like a C minus average or something, like way, way down in the pecking order when he graduated. He was counseled not to go to college, literally. I remember the, I'm talking to the counselor, you know, and I talked to him. He says, no, look, Todd, he's just not, not going to make it. You know, don't even try. And I was just furious. I said, Todd, don't listen to him. But teachers in schools have a big impact in students' decision making. He says, Dad, I like mechanics. I want to do that. I said, OK, great. You know, if you're going to do it, do it the right way. So we had the diesel school all picked out for him. He was just about to go, and then he saw the movie Top Gun. Remember that movie, Top Gun? Came home, you know, and uh, he said, I want to be a pilot. I said, go for it. I said, you realize you've got to go to college? He said, yeah, I, I do realize that. I said, good. I said, I'll support you. Uh, and so he had to go to two years of junior college because he didn't have the right courses. Then he went to four years at uh, University of Colorado, aerospace engineering, where he graduated with honors. Hated every minute of it, all right? Uh, got into the Navy, and he went through the program called, uh, ever see the movie Officer and a Gentleman? Went through that program. It was number one in his class. You know, got jets, if you remember that. You know. Uh, was assigned F-18s, and then uh, 10 years ago, he actually went through the Top Gun training. Uh, and it was neat to go to the, the graduation. It was kind of a three, you know, full circle. I said, what do you think? This is really neat. Uh, the, the parents got to go. Uh, it was not like the movie, by the way. <laughs> Kelly McGillis was not there. I looked. <laughs> I said, tell me, what do you think about this? He says, it really feels good. I really accomplished something, you know. Now, he became a commander of his squadron, did a great job there, and he was about to get out. And uh, then the Navy said, you've been selected to be commander of an aircraft carrier. Six people a year. Uh, and actually, he went through the power school program here in Charleston. He was doing that last year, last year when I was here. Uh, and I remember talking to him. I, I said, Todd, this is, this is a big commitment. And I said, you want to do it? He said, oh, yes, I would love to. I said, what, what's, what, what, what are your hesitations? He said, I remember, I'm not an academic. I said, Todd, you've done well. And the Navy, but the Navy said they warned them. They said, this is the most rigorous academic program in the world, according to them. 
In a year's period of time, you get the equivalent of a, of a master's degree in nuclear engineering in one year period of time, and then you si spend six months working on a nuclear reactor. He says, this is amazingly rigorous. This is not me just flying. I'm going to get some of the best academics, you know, in the entire Navy. I said, trust your heart, you know, but it's always worked. You know, if you want it, you know, you know you're going to do it. You're going to work, work hard enough. Well, I uh, spent a year here, six months. It was just back in uh, when? What is it now? Just in May that uh, he, he graduated. Uh, and in uh, August, he'll take over as a second command, the EXO of the USS Lincoln. And then assuming he doesn't sink that, then he'll turn into a captain. <laughs> uh, now, other than bragging for my kid, here's the point of that story. This was a kid who was not counseled to go to college who got a degree in aerospace engineering, then he got a master's degree in, nuclear, in, in security, then a master's degree in nuclear engineering. Now he's taking over you know, a 5,500-person 5, ship, one of the most responsible jobs in the Navy. You know, and that was, a, you know, again, not counseled to go to school. Do you see what we're missing? Thank God he saw the movie. <laughs> I have nightmares. What, had he, what, what it would have happened had he seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre? <laughs> That same night, I don't know. Uh, now that's the promise for me of a competency-based system. Imagine the academics are there, you're shoring them up, but you're also saying, pick, be passionate about something. I don't care what it is, as long as it's not immoral or illegal, and we are going to support you in doing that. The country needs a district to do that. Please continue what you're doing. Thank you very much.